Well, guys, let's go ahead and get started. We uh, we're glad to see you guys. And uh, I, I said there's gonna be there's gonna be six people in here, and five of them be on the very back row. And there you guys are. But at least you came together. I appreciate that. That was good. Um, we are glad that for those of you who may be at home watching on Facebook uh, to be with us for Bible study. Uh, boy, just a, a tough week in our in our community. There's a lot of folks that are dealing with COVID right now, and uh, and we're praying for each and every one of them. There's a lot of people who may not, you know, there's several people that have been tested positive, but there's several more that have been in contact with people that have tested positive, even though they themselves may not have. And so, uh, so those of you who are in quarantine right now, we got several. Uh, we, uh, we know that's not a fun situation to be in, but we know that God's going to meet all you need. So we're praying for you and all that. Preacher, there, yes, ma'am. I found out today, uh, Marlena Brewer, do y'all know Marlena from Georgia? Well, she's got it. And she's got pneumonia, too. Mm. She's pretty sick. Wow. It's, uh, you she know, is JJ's wife. No, she's JJ's mom. Okay. Married to Lori. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John yeah, 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 yeah. I think they were all together at Thanksgiving. Yes. And that's, you know, these next few days will be about that, that window where, you know, anybody who was together with somebody on, on Thanksgiving, is, you know, it'll, it'll come through if they're going to have it. So, I got uh, two in my family that just tested positive this week. Right there beside us there. You know, back, back in, the, in July when it hit, you know, our youth and, and it kind of made its run through our community. It's, it's making a second run, and it feels like this time, even though we don't have one, you know, particular group that's got it so bad, like the youth did, it, it's making a more widespread run this time. Um, so just be careful. Continue to, you know, continue to take care of yourselves, and uh, you know, I, 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 there's no, there's no true prevention of it. Just do everything you can to be careful in it. Um, Vaccine? Yes. Yeah, but not, not, I mean, you and I probably aren't going to be able to get it no, for a little while. So, yeah. The yeah. That, they're, they're inching closer and closer to, to you know, releasing that and, and doing all the steps they have to do. Uh, they seem to be towards the end of the trials. But, uh, again, you know, I, I wouldn't look for anything before the first of the year even yeah. possible for, you know, for the regular guy to get it or the regular girl to get it, you know. Um, and, and, and rightfully so. I mean, you know, it needs to go to essential workers. It needs to go to healthcare professionals, things like that, to protect them first so they can keep going. And right now, that's one of the big concerns is there's so much, you know, overwhelming going on in the hospital system. So, um, but as somebody was saying this morning, uh, you know, the, it seems like the mortality of it, at least in the numbers that, that we've been seeing, seems to be a little bit better, still not good, but better. And that's got to be because of early treatment and things like that, and people being able to, and the, the more access to testing, and you know, having that be a more commonplace thing. So. Have the people who've already gotten it are they immune to it? <laughs> the, back when we had it, they said 60 to 90 days, so two to three months would be the reasonable window. Um, so I talked to somebody the other day who said that somebody had had it six months ago, still had antibodies, so they would still be considered immune. But I. I don't think they know, and I definitely don't know. Uh, I've, I've kind of been operating under the idea that, that my two to three months is up, and I could possibly get it again. So that's why I've been, just, you know, trying to be careful. Um, I, you know, I hate wearing a mask. It doesn't. It's not comfortable. But if it, if it helps in any way, shape, or form, I do it. You know, that's why I have one on this morning. You know, and, and, and I'm not going to preach with one on. I'm not going to teach with one on. You know, but, but in the midst of moving in and out of people. I mean, why, at that point, why not? You know, I, I, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that uncomfortable to, you know. Um, but uh, but I, like people, like I told people, uh, you know, everywhere I go, they're like, why are you wearing it? You've already had it. I'm like, because I don't want it again. I, and I don't. I mean, whew. Uh, Charlie and I were talking about this morning, you know, if, it, if it's worse the second time, I definitely don't want it because it was bad enough the first time. So, uh, but we're going to keep, you know, moving on. As of right now, our plan is to is to stay steady with our services, um, you know, and, and just take it day by day, week by week. I know there's some some local churches who are, you know, having to make some changes. Feel like that's the best thing, and we may very well get to that. I don't know, uh, but we're we're just trying to listen and uh, and do the best we can. Obviously, you saw this morning. Of course, bad weather doesn't help anything either. You know, that keeps a lot of folks out. Um, but uh, but. A lot of people, I think, because they knew people had tested positive and were quarantined and stuff like that, you know, we were we were down missing a few folks this morning, um, and so that may come and go, you know, and, and help. But 
that's right for them to do. So if you're at home right now and you didn't feel comfortable coming out here tonight, that's okay. That's totally all right. We're going to keep working through this situation as best we possibly can and uh, praying the Lord's protection and his guidance in all of us. So let's go to the Lord right now and we'll, we'll go ahead and pray together. Father God, we do love you and we thank you for what was a great morning here at Harrisville, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you um, have given us Glenn and Julie for all these many years and all the ways that they've served. We thank you for them. We pray for them as well, Lord, that you would bless them and protect them as they make this move and let it, let it be a great thing in their families' lives. Father God, we ask, Lord, that you protect and, and take care of and heal those who are dealing with COVID right now. Father, for those that are in quarantine, whether they have it or have tested positive for it or not, God, help them to be lifted up, to be encouraged, and Lord, continue to heal bodies and heal health, um, Father, of all those who are afflicted with this. Lord God, for each of us, help us to do the best we can to minister to one another by being safe and by being careful with one another, uh, but not letting it hold back the, uh, the opportunities that we have to fellowship with one another in a way that gives us, uh, you glory and, and builds us up. Father, also don't let it get in the way of how we share your word with all the people that we can possibly do. Uh, Father, help us to do that with a, a, a kind and loving spirit, but an excitement and an urgency, knowing that with each passing day, we come closer and closer to the day your son Jesus will return. And there'll be, um, it'll be uh, the time to, uh, to, to be on one side or another, not to get on one side or another. Father, help us to be on your side by putting our faith squarely in Jesus. Teach us a little bit more about him tonight in Mark chapter 2. And uh, Father, let us be better off for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, we are in the second half of Mark 2. We're going to continue to work through the book of Mark as we go. And uh, we've, uh, we've seen Jesus come on the scene. He was baptized by John the Baptist, um, fulfilling prophecy and also setting up an example for us to follow him once we put our faith in him to be baptized and to be baptized um, by immersion and, and in the way that he was baptized as best we can read it in Scripture. And, and now we've seen here in the last several verses and passages that he is starting to minister around uh, the communities. And he's, he's going from place to place, and everywhere he goes, um, there's a crowd coming. I mean, they've seen him heal people. They've seen him uh, deliver people who were demon-possessed. And then he's already started now to talk about forgiveness of sins, which was a strange and, and unique thing for him to talk about, even a thing that, as we read last week, that they thought was wrong. And, uh, and here begins, uh, in Mark's account anyway, here begins the, the, the attack of the people who don't understand Jesus. And anytime somebody doesn't understand someone, they, they attack them based on what they do understand, right? I mean, think about it. With, with this virus, what, how, did the, how did scientists and researchers go about trying to attack the virus? Well, they took the things that they already knew to be true, and they applied it in those situations, and the things that still worked, they could go down that path, and if it was something different, then they had to find another path to attack COVID, just like they do in any type of scientific experiment where you're trying to solve a problem. And so we do that in our social circles, too. We definitely do that in our faith as well. Our framework of faith does give us a kind of a a lens through which to see the whole world and so when something happens uh, and we see something we experience something that doesn't look right through our lens we we have some choices to make we we can either investigate it further or we can let it slide or we can um, we can you know if we see it something that we need to stand up to or stand up against then we stand up to it all based on what we understand and that's where these people are coming from um, it's it's interesting though to me that you know all the time when you hear people trying to trick Jesus or attack Jesus they are made to be the bad guys in the good guy, bad guy, bad guy story of Jesus. And that, the truth that's told in all of the Gospels is this, is that we're all the bad guys. You know I mean, we, we all do this. And when it comes to us coming to Jesus, no matter how long we've been in church, we still have this whole sin nature that we battle all the time. And this is the way of thinking that is selfish, that he is constantly working and constantly delivering us from. He's working to correct and to get rid of in our lives. And so as we read about these Pharisees that, that uh, were very much confused and, and perplexed and, and even angered by what Jesus and his disciples did, uh, we got to understand that that's how we all come to Jesus too. Now, it's only through his grace that he allows us to come to know him, to trust him, and to be on his side as, as opposed to against him. But until that happens, and as that happens, the natures that are, uh, you know, and that are, at, in, can't even say the word, the natures that are present within us, um, 
they, they war against what Jesus is doing in our souls. And so we read in Mark chapter 2, and we'll begin with verse 18. We'll go through verse 28. And we see, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? And Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Jesus uses some analogies, some pictures, some imagery here that, uh, that, that, that make the point that he's trying to make here. And this is the point of these, these two parts of the passage here, or these two sections in Mark chapter 2. The, the point is, is that here you have people confronting the God himself who set up their religion. And because he's doing it in a way that doesn't line up with their understanding of his religion and his faith that he's given them and directed them in, because they don't understand it, they think that he's wrong. And so they attack him. These questions are very much coming out of an attack. They're, they're saying, oh, wait, well, this doesn't make any sense. You're doing it wrong. Well, I mean, any time God moves amongst his people in any period of time, in any age, in any era, in any millennium, when he moves in his people, the ones who, are, who know that it's a move of God, they go along with it and they follow him with all their hearts. But the ones who don't quite understand that, the ones who have a hard time seeing that, end up bucking against it. And that's exactly what's going on here. We know that Jesus came to fulfill all of these laws and all of these commandments that he had given in the Old Testament. And he came to finish it. He came to complete it. He came to bring it uh, to full fruition so that, that people would understand who Jesus is, that he is the Savior that, we, that these folks had long awaited, and, and he is the one that would forevermore be our Savior. Uh, but because they didn't understand, because it was very different, they, they bucked against it. They attacked against it. Uh, we see there in verse 18, it says, John's disciples and, and the Pharisees were fasting. Well, a couple of things we need to understand is fasting... It may be something that you do and I do now, but at that time, fasting was something that was considered kind of a, an advanced move in faith. If you were a Jewish person, especially amongst the Pharisees, fasting would be one of the ways that they showed off how very religious they were. And one of the ways that they showed their, their extreme and elite faith in God was to fast, and the Pharisees would fast twice a week. And of course, to fast means to go without something. The idea of Christian fasting or the idea of Jewish fasting in this would be that you would go without food or go without something that you needed so that you could fully, more fully focus on God who supplies all of your needs. And nobody fasted forever. You die that way, right? If you, fa if you don't eat over several days, weeks, whatever, however long it takes, you die, right? So God never would call anybody to, to fast to their death, but... Fasting was something that God did set up, that God still honors, that God still works through. If you're, you know, if you're living out your faith in Christ, fasting very well and very much should be a part of it in some way or another. Now, it may be fasting from food. It may be fasting from TV. It may be fasting from news. It can be fasting from anything because the idea is to cut something out of your life for a period of time so that you can spend more of that time, effort, and resource focusing on paying attention to God. So in that sense, you could fast from sports. You could fast from 
you know, driving. I, you know, what, you can fast from whatever, you know, and, and it still be something that was on. But the Pharisees were very much, uh, very proud of their stance that they were going to stay away from anything that was unholy. Uh, in fact, the word Pharisee actually means set apart ones, in other words, or separate ones, that they, the, the, by name, they were known as the ones who were different from everybody else, who were, took their faith to the next level, to the extreme, to where they wouldn't even associate with them. That's why, when we read about, in the first part of Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 2 last week, we see that, that when Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, these Pharisees had a problem, because their whole, um, their whole status was about being above and separate from the sinners, the tax collectors, the not, you know, the not so greats, the, the less thans, and that's how they did it. Well, obviously, that's a terrible way to live out our faith in God, and Jesus showed that that was not the way he wanted by doing what he did in, in making sure that he went to those people and offered you know, the, the, the hospital to the sick, not to the, to the well, as he put it. But these folks are, are fasting twice a week. They're showing up. They're making a big deal out of it a lot of times is to show how pious and how religious and how, how great they are in their faith. And, it, and it's really become uh, much more of a pride issue, much more of a social issue than it is what it's supposed to be. And so John's disciples also fasted. We don't get the idea that John's disciples fasted in the same way the Pharisees did. Um, and that's really neither here nor there because Jesus still was going to teach something in this moment, as he does with every time somebody attacks. So John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? First off, they noticed about the people who are following Jesus that they're doing things different than what we understand people do. They were, I mean, so many people at that point were disciples of someone, disciples of a rabbi, disciples of a teacher, disciples of a prophet, disciples of a this or a that. And, but they all kind of did a lot of the same things. And so when Jesus' disciples weren't fasting that same way, and he wasn't directing them to fast that same way, they started to say, oh, well, maybe this is where he's fallen down. Maybe this new ministry is not really what's all cracked up to be. And so, again, based on what they understood, they attacked what they didn't understand. And Jesus took that time to lovingly teach them. He said, it says, Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? And what he's asking here, he's talking about a wedding. Um, obviously, we know the, the illustration of the, the church being the bride of Christ and, and Christ being the bridegroom of the church and that, that at some point in the future when he returns, the two will be united for all of eternity, just like in a marriage. That's the idea there. Uh, and so what we see here is, is he's using the same illustration to talk about this. Well, he's saying, he said, why would they, the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? The idea of that was to celebrate the bridegroom in that moment as much as you could because he was going to go off. He was going to go away on his, you know, in, in his marriage and, and, and leave that part of the family and start his new family. And so you wanted to soak up the time. In fact, the Pharisees, we understand uh, based on a lot of scholarly work that was done by people way smarter than me, that the Pharisees even believed in all of their piety and all their religion that weddings were so important that if a commandment in the law told you not to do something and that got in the way of having a good time at a wedding, then go ahead and just have a good time. Like that, They actually believed that. In fact, what we see, even though the Pharisees were known for being set apart, the Pharisees had become masters in showing how set apart they were, but also in finding ways to circumvent the system. To, to, to make loopholes in the word of God and the law of God to be able to do what they wanted to do. That still goes on in, in Jewish circles today when it comes to referencing, or, or excuse me, uh, to, to, to giving reverence to the Sabbath. We'll get to that in just a minute. But he says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? In other words, there's no point in fasting when they have the person that they're trying to get in touch with and trying to spend more time with right there in front of them, right? His disciples had him right in their midst, right in their lives, right in every part of what they were doing. They were walking with him and living with him and working with him and following and learning from him. They didn't need to fast to seek God because God was right there leading them each and every day. He says, but, uh, he says they cannot fast, uh, you know, while he is with them, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. So this is not a question of whether fasting is good or bad. It's all in the approach that's taken to it and making sure that we understand 
where it fits into the larger scale of, of our faith. There's a lot of things that people say, you got to do this or you can't do that. And, and it gets to the point where it's just about the action and it's not about the reason why the action is good or bad for the God that we serve. Uh, he goes on to give two more examples here. He says, no one sews a patch of, of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. Well, he's talking about patching a garment, right? Um, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if kids do this anymore. It used to be, you know, we used to have those old tough skin jeans, you know, and, and when you'd wear out the knees in them as a little boy, what did mama do? She'd just iron on a patch or she'd sew in a patch behind it and you'd work on wearing that one out too, you know? Uh, we, we had those, and, and I don't know that, you know, now, <laughs> I guess we probably kind of like some holy jeans too, but not quite the way they are these days, <laughs> but I just shows I'm getting a little bit older, but, uh, but you know, that idea of a patch, well, you know, if the patch didn't go on just right, you might end up having a rip between the patch and the, the part, you know, the original part of the pants. Well, that's what he's saying here. He's saying if you have a garment and you patch it, you want to make sure that you, you do it wisely. Well, how does he mean? Well, if you took an unshrunk piece of cloth, what's going to happen to an unshrunk piece of cloth? It's going to shrink. But if you put it into that hole and, and make that patch in the garment and it shrinks against that garment that's already shrunk, well, it's going to pull away. And now you tried to fix a problem of having a hole in it. And now you're going to have more holes, right? It's just not, it's not going to be a correct solution. Um, he goes on also to say, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine in new or into new wine skins. Same thing with wine. Of course, we know that wine is fermented grapes and uh, fermented grape juice, and so the fermentation process gives off gas. And so, if you pour new wine into a wine skin that had already been stretched to its capacity because it had had old wine in it that that, that had already done this process if you poured new wine in it it was going to ferment some more the gas was going to be let off and it was going to expand those wine skins and what was it going to do just like jesus said it was going to burst the wine skins and now the wine spilled out it's no good anymore and you got a wine skin that doesn't hold wine anymore right so they were both uh, in trying to do something good but doing it unwisely or doing it not in full understanding you end up doing something bad, right? And that's exactly what he's telling him here. He's saying about this fasting thing, he's saying, it's good that you fast, but the reason you fast is not the right reason. You don't fit it in the right way. You're not, you know, he kind of looks at him and says, you're doing it wrong, you know? And what he's saying to them is this. He's saying that what I am doing, what Jesus is doing is new. And so you have to understand it in the proper framework of how things are set up. That was their big problem. None of these folks didn't want the Messiah to show up. They just didn't understand that he showed up the way he showed up. And so he's saying to them that when new things come, new interacts with old in certain ways. And he gave different examples about it. But if you don't understand how new and old are supposed to work together, how, how new and old are supposed to interact well, then you're going to have chaos. You're going to have dissension. You're going to have division. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He says, no, you pour new wine into new wineskins. Why? Because those new wineskins haven't been stretched yet. And so what happens? The fermentation continues to happen. The gas is given off. And those new wineskins stretch to absorb all of it. And you have a perfectly sound wineskin. And the wine in it is protected. But if it bursts, you don't. Same thing with the patch of unshrunk cloth. If you put a new patch into an old garment, well, the new patch is going to shrink and pull away from it. What he's telling them here is, is that this way you've been doing it and the ways that you've understood it, it's incomplete. And he is the completion of it. So he's trying to explain to them that he is doing something new and they have to open themselves up to understand it in the proper context, in the proper framework, in the way that it's, it's meant by the one who, you know, who gave them the law to begin with the way he meant it. He goes on, it says, uh, to deal with the Sabbath. He says in verse 23, it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. This wouldn't have been uncommon. You know, were they picking it and eating it right away? Maybe. Were they picking it and storing it away for later on so they could make, you know, some bread or, so, you know, some flour to make bread? Maybe. Either way. But here's the thing. It was on the Sabbath. What we would know as Friday from sundown to Saturday at sundown. Bad news for American Christians, the Sabbath is not Sunday, at least in a Jewish context. Does it matter which day the Sabbath is, though? Not really. It matters that we have a Sabbath, and we'll see that in just a second. 
Uh, even though Jesus doesn't come out and say, hey, you can do it whatever day you want, he does tell us the, the proper way of looking at man and the Sabbath or people and the Sabbath. So they were picking grain on the Sabbath. Well, that was a sin, right? That was, that was breaking the Sabbath because the Sabbath, the whole idea, as God showed us in the, in the account of creation, he rested on the seventh day. And so we too are to take six days to work and a seventh day to rest kind of like the fasting situation, so that we can ignore the rest of all the stuff that gets all of our attention and our effort and our time and focus more at least one full day of the week on the Lord. Well, you know, it's hard as a preacher to talk about doing that because, you know, we tell everybody to rest on Sundays and we do most of our work, you know, or some of our most you know, stressful days are Sunday. And, and sometimes we find ourselves getting caught up in that. So we have to, as, you know, as ministers, we have to find, a, a, you know, a way to have a Sabbath for ourselves. But here's the thing. They were upset at Jesus' disciples because they were doing this wrong. Now, they were doing it differently. Jesus didn't turn around and say, oh, put that back, or, or why'd you pick that? That was wrong. You're sinning and all that stuff. They were, they were wanting to point this out. And they came from a, a, a kind of a setting where they would point that out. If they were with people and one of their disciples had done it, they would have made a public example of them. Now, some of them probably would have gently and kindly and lovingly helped them through that. But a lot of them, again, because they were always wanting to show how religious they were and how elite in their faith they were, they probably would have made an example of that person. And they're like, well, why is this guy, why is this teacher letting his disciples break the Sabbath? This is crazy. Um, it says, the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now, that's a pretty big accusation. You're saying to Jesus, your followers are doing it wrong, right? You're saying to Jesus, God himself that the people who are doing what you say are sinning. That's a big accusation. They don't even understand how big of an accusation it is. But again, Jesus takes an opportunity to teach them in the same idea. And this is, I believe, why Mark records these things together. Because he's kind of coming to a main theme here in this part of the book. He sa it says, Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? Jesus refers back to something in Jewish history, something from the Old Testament, an action of King David who was very well re renowned and very well thought of and, and you know, was, was the greatest king they'd ever had. Um, and, and he says, In the days of Abiathar the, pre the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. So he's saying here, okay, you, you celebrate David even though he did something that was against ceremonial law. It says, and he also gave some to his companions. Now, here's the thing. The, the Pharisees had fallen into a trap that if we're not careful in 2020, as Christians, we can fall into too. It's a trap in the way that they thought. And the way that they thought let their religion override the point of their, of their practicing of religion. Does that make sense? So they let the things that they did as a part of their religion, the rules, the checklists, the laws they let those become the thing that they were serving, in fact, the God that they were serving in a lot of ways, instead of the God who gave them those laws. And so, well, we know what Angela's doing right now. <laughs> she, she's, she's checking the stream. That's Angela, I want to say to you through the camera and right over there, hello. Uh, <laughs> so so the, the thing is that God gave them the law that, that they took and misinterpreted and, and brought into this weird way of understanding it that gave them so much problem in how they understood Jesus. God gave them the law for a purpose. The purpose wasn't just to obey the law. The purpose was to see how much of a rat race it was to try to obey the law. And that's why the law is so detailed. That's why the law is so, in, in fact, Scripture tells us is impossible for us to keep. We can't ever keep all of it without messing up, without breaking a commandment. And that was the point of the law, to show us how sinful we were and to show us how sinful we are. If Christianity was just about, well, you do this and you don't do this and you never mix the two together, well, we constantly mess it up because we constantly mess those things up. We can act like we don't. We can say that some people don't. We all do. I mean, every one of us does. And some of us more often than others. I mean, you know, I mean, it's... it's it's such a strange thing to, to think that these people thought that that was how it was supposed to go, but they just didn't see what God was doing. And so God set these systems up 
so that the people would understand that they needed this Savior that was to come. Well, here's this Savior right in front of them, and they're so steeped in the doing of all this stuff that they don't understand him right before them. Does that make sense? So they, they, they're not getting the purpose of why the law is there. And that's what, that's what Jesus is telling them. He's using David as an example um, where he would have literally broken the law, gone into the temple or gone into the house of the Lord and eaten bread that was only for the priest. And, and you can go back and, and, and check that passage out if you'd like to look at it. But, but, but he, he, he did this. Why did he do this? Was David just like, man, I sure do want that temple bread. <laughs> that, 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 that temple bread's like a, you know, I don't know, you pick your favorite food, a Krispy Kreme donut and the hot sign's on, you know, or whatever. I, I, I want to go in there and get it and we're going to party up. No, his, his men were starving. His men were hungry. And so literally at this point, Jesus is using this example to show that even the ceremonial stuff is not as important as the person that is participating in the ceremonial stuff. Now, he's not telling us that, well, hey, just do whatever you want because you're the most important. But what he is saying is, is that God cares more for the people that he's given the law to than he cares for the simple acts of obeying the law. Does that make sense? It, it, that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. It seems simple, uh, but it's a big, big thing. We, we deal with children all the time. We tell them, hey, don't do this and don't do that because we can't, we know that at, at their level, depending on how old of a child they are, they can't understand all the whys and the whatnots. But we know someone has matured as a, as a human being when they can not only understand what to do and what not to do, but why to do one thing and why not do, to understand the concept behind that. That's a higher level of thinking. And the same thing is true in our faith. Jesus says to them, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And this is the thing. God did not create us to follow a bunch of laws. God did not command us to follow a bunch of rules. God did not command us to check off a bunch of boxes. Oh, we do this, and we don't do that, and we're here at this time, and we do this other thing, and all this. That's not what God created us for. God created us, and he loved us because we're his creation. And he gave those things to show us what's going on. And then he gives us Jesus and the gift in Christ of the Holy Spirit for us to begin to grow and learn and mature to know why. Well, why do we need to have a Sabbath? It's not that out there there's some you know, cosmic Sabbath that has to be satisfied. No, it's a way for us to be able to focus on God the way that we should be. It's a means to an end. These folks, sadly, were making it the end itself. You don't dishonor the Sabbath. You don't break the Sabbath. Why are your guys picking the bread or picking the grain uh, on the Sabbath? You can't do that. Even today, if you went to Israel, I've told you guys about this before. You know, you, you, you get on an elevator from Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, and there's a Sabbath elevator, and you don't have to push the buttons because it stops on every floor because pushing the button would be considered to be work. Now, that's picking nits. Does God care a lick? Does it take away from your seeking of God if you don't push the button or if you do push the button? Uh, what if God's on the fourth floor and you're on the first? You might need to push the button to go see. Uh, I'm kidding. But, but what I'm saying here is, is that all these little nitpicky rules end up becoming idols. And the following of it ends up becoming its own religion apart from the God who gave the rules to point out our need for him to begin with. And he says... So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And that's why I say to you this morning, this evening, what, what time is it? It's been dark all day. Uh, this, that's why I say to you this evening that it's not what day of the week are you going to pick to have the Sabbath or to honor the Sabbath. It's that you know in a given seven-day period. You need God and attention to, and to give him your attention throughout every day. But you need a special set of, set of minutes, set of hours a special set of time that you spend specifically for him. It's kind of like paying a tithe or an offering. It's not that you pay, you're not paying dues to the church. You're not just doing it to be a good church member or to be generous even. You're doing it because you're celebrating that God's blessed you. And so what do you do? You, you give back to what he's doing. And it's not about the dollar amount. It's about the heart of you as a giver. And what that action actually is instead of just doing the action. It's the same thing with coming to church. Do you come to church because that's what mama made you do, you know, and that's what you always had to do? 
Or do you come to church because it's a, it's a place where you can go to celebrate the Lord, to learn about the Lord, to grow, to serve the Lord, and to do all these things? Jesus is still, through the power of the Holy Spirit, still teaching us about how all this stuff should fit together. And we're still, just like the Pharisees, every one of us at one level or another, we're still having to overcome our misunderstandings of it. And when he does teach us the new part of it, the, the, or the part that's new to us, if we, if we, as scripture says, lean on our own understandings, well, we're going to fight against what God does. But if we lean on the Lord, if we give him our trust and our faith, well, then that new thing that he's teaching us or those new things that he's teaching us and calling us into, well, then we enter into it in a totally different way. None of us like change. Um, 2020 has shown, <laughs> has put a big time spotlight on that. <laughs> you know, none of us like to do things different, but hey, you know, and, and we, we've been picking about Ken and, you know, gnawing on the, on the little wrapper this morning. And that was a different way to do that. Uh, it felt different to observe the Lord's Supper that way. But it was necessary for the time. And just like what Jesus was talking to them about, about the Sabbath, you know, does it, does it have to be unleavened bread and, and grape juice? Could it be, you know, could it be, I don't know, Wonder Bread and a Diet Coke? Sure, it could, you know, because, again, those are just means to the end of remembering what Jesus has done for us. Um, now, do we need to change all that up just to, for the sake of change? No. But sometimes, like with David and his men and the, and the temple bread, sometimes it's a necessity. The last thing that I think Jesus would want us to know about that is, is he's the one that chooses when it's a necessity and when it's not. Right? Because if we're the one that chooses whether it's a necessity or not, now we get into the great American way of just do what you like, right? And, and we all are in that, <laughs> you know. Um, but as we learn about who Jesus is, as we learn to come to know him in a more intimate way, we start to see, well, okay, well, maybe it doesn't have to be this way because we've always done it this way. But maybe this also honors Jesus because he's leading us to that. And that's where it starts is to, is to have to, you know, you're not trying to look for loopholes and trying to look to do it differently, but sometimes it arises in a way that it has to be done differently. And he'll guide us, he'll guide you to that no matter what it is. And if he doesn't guide it to you, then it may very well be that you may be breaking the Sabbath or you may be breaking, you know, the commandment that he's given you. And it may be sin, but when we lean on him, he always tells us that our relationship with him and our relationship with God the Father through him is the most important thing. And how we show and live that is simply part of it. It's not the thing, the, it's not the whole thing itself. What are some of you guys' thoughts about what Jesus was saying when he was talking about the Sabbath and talking about the new wineskins and the, uh, the new cloth? Well, I didn't know that about the wine, about it expanded like that. I would love to tell you that I, you know, that I was an expert on all that, but that's about, what I told you tonight is about all I know about. <laughs> Oh, goodness. There's, there's a lot of history in that that I don't know. It's like so many other things, though. It, it, it fit into a particular context somewhere, and then it caught on, and we just keep going with it. Yeah. Uh, some people, you know, some people equate it back to the worship of a sun god, and it was that day, and so Christianity kind of came alongside of that. And, and in the early days of the Catholic Church, you know, that, that kind of went the way. I don't know, you know, but I mean, but even today, I mean, within driving distance of where we live, you could find a Christian worship service that's just as Christian as one on Sunday morning on a Friday night somewhere or a Wednesday night or a Tuesday afternoon. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. I think it's kind of like minutes. Well, what's a minute? You know, we only know a minute is 60 seconds. Well, what's a second? We only know because we all at some point. <laughs> right. Now we're going philosophizing. Right? But. But no, I mean, somewhere along the line, we agreed on it. Well, like an inch. You know, an inch in, in, the, in our system of measurement used to be the length from the knuckle of a king's thumb to the tip of it. Well, what happened when you changed kings and the one king was 6'3 and the other one was 5'2? Uh, you know, how does that work? I'm, you know, and it did. It changed. And so somewhere along the line, they said, okay, this is the standard unit of measure, and we agree on it. And that's kind of where we are. I mean, as, as far as, uh, as why do we go to church on Sunday mornings and you know, have church. Why is Sunday the church day? It's because it's in our culture. It's an agreed on day. Our businesses, not as much as they used to be, and we all know that. But but still, 
businesses often are closed on Sundays, you know, and, and, it, and it, get, it fits it in to where we can, you know, rightfully practice our faith and still practice, you know, the other things we need to do to live our lives as well. well I can remember growing up, you know, store, all stores are closed on Sundays. Period. Sure. And most of them on Saturdays too, huh? I mean, used to have 10 that stayed open until 10 o'clock. What is it? Scandalous. Totally scandalous. <laughs> 10 o'clock, that's the. <laughs> well, he'd open up early that morning, and by the time the church started, he closed the store. Oh, 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 he closed 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh, 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 I see. I thought you meant 10 o'clock at night. I, I pick at Sherry because every time after a ball game, we're trying to find something to eat in McGee, and it's 10 o'clock, and there's literally like two things open that aren't Taco Bell. And I was like, Sherry, how did you grow up here? She's like, there's more now than there was when I was growing up here. I'm like, you know, so uh, Jose's does a great job there. I guess I'm advertising for Jose on here, but that's all right. Uh, one of the things that I really had not thought about was Sunday school. Mm -hmm. You said that the reason for fasting was to get close to God, and God was there. So what was the purpose in fasting? And you know, that's one of those quick little hitters that sometimes we can read over real quick when we're reading the Gospels. Absolutely. Um, but you know, and it's not until we study it to teach it or we sit in the Bible study and study it ourselves, you know, to that, that those types of things come out. But you know, so much of the stuff that, that, that we sometimes think of as like fanatical or all so so much of it is, is very much ingrained in our faith. And it's just a matter of finding, okay, how God are you guiding me? To do those things, you know, to be a part of it. Um, obviously, I haven't fasted from too many meals. <laughs> I tell you though, you know, fasting for meals for me did, never really, you know, did what it was supposed to do. I tell you what was the best, the best fasting I've ever done in my life is when I, you know, because I drive a good bit, especially now, when I turn that radio off and I just am in silence. Now I don't bow my head and close my eyes while I'm driving and pray. But, but during those times when I'm fasting from radio, whether it be sports radio or news radio or you know, music, whatever, it's just, it, it carves out time in your day purposefully mm -hmm. to do something of God as opposed to just doing something else, you know. Um, one of these days I'll fast from, you know, watching college football, but I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> that may be fanatical. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm too far That's right. God doesn't want that much time with me. No, he does. He does. <laughs> I spend too much time watching that. I, uh, this is just, this is just interesting. Before I made that go. He was talking about who established the inch and the pound. And I was watching one of these shows on uh, science type things where they go all over the world. And how do they measure in metric as far as weight? What is that? Like grams, kilograms on that? Yeah. It was a. And they, and then Sky, he said, uh, come back here, he's going to show something. And he went in there and, and they brought out this box and opened it up and there was a silver ball in there. I don't know if you saw that or not. And uh, I didn't see that particular one, but I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And they said that you can't even touch it with you. You had to wear gloves to pick it up. And it was, it was a, a, a weight. They said, this is the standard by which all metric weight is judged. Why do you have to have gloves to pick it up? Because your hands could affect the weight of it if something didn't oh. touch it. It's that know. exact. It was that exact as, you know. Oh my gosh. Yep. But that was, you say, well, what, what is really, what is an ounce? Let's say, what is a pound in America? Well, if you had one thing laying here that said, this is a pound, and this is what we establish a pound as being of a whole country. This is it. You know, so you wouldn't want to damage it. You wouldn't want to abuse wow. it. Do they only have one thing? Yes. But there's only one. Because yep. everything has to be judged on that one thing. What happens if it breaks? They, that's why you have it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want to be the one to break that. <laughs> they, they'll string you up for that. <laughs> we know who to blame, though, now. <laughs> if it comes up broke, we're going to That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, and just real quick, you know, when when you have a standard of measurement and it gets off, it throws everything off. Everything else is I, that old Jeep that I bought, I somebody know. along the line put different size tires on it, and they didn't recalibrate the speedometer. There you go. Well, so 
when the, when the cop pulls me over, and he hasn't yet, and I don't think he will, because I found, thankfully I found this out. Um, but, you know, when I, when I bought it, it didn't go more than about 52 miles an hour. I didn't realize that that 52 miles an hour was more like 67. <laughs> And that can make a difference in a lot of ways, you know. <laughs> so, so again, if it throws that standard off, and that's what the Word of God is for us, right? I mean, the Word of God is that standard. Yeah, there's a gear you have to go in and mess with or change out to to match it. Yeah, man. Because I'd be driving thinking, it feels like I'm going faster than that. But, I, you know, it's been a while since I've driven, that, driven a Jeep. And, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, hey, look, and if it's going 67, I'm going too fast on that thing. I don't need to be going 67 on that deal. So. You're talking about the heat, y'all. I always think about this fellow. Uh, uh, I'm not going to Shut the business. Yeah. I went in there one day, and he was sitting there, and he said, hold on, man. Oh, I had a guy feel like such a stare. Missed it by one inch. Just a minute by one inch. I said, well, that ain't bad. You may care that. He said, well, you missed it 152 times. <laughs> 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 oh, no. Th things add up, don't they? That's right. That's right, man. Well, guys, I've been, I've enjoyed having Ken and Edmund with us, and uh, I don't know, man. Maybe we'll maybe we'll work it out where we can get some practice in, and still have y'all in here for Bible study sometime down the road. We'll get together and figure all that out, though. Uh, of course, we want to pray for Glenn and Julie as they head out. That moving trucks coming tomorrow. Uh, I've offered to help move, but they, they sound like they got it. So uh, that doesn't mean that I won't help if they call. But, uh, but so just pray for them as they make that move. They've been working towards it for a while. And if you know somebody wanting to buy a house, send them that way. They can use a buyer. And uh, we're excited about the things that God's going to do is, uh, for us and uh, who he brings to work with musicians and music, uh, as well as all the other parts of our church. Um, and so excited to see how God's going to do that. So, um, also trusting him to take care of us during this, this swing of the pandemic in our area. And uh, we'll just continue to pray for think, one another. Do you see us having to close the church back down? You know, like I said earlier, we're going to take it a day at a time. Um, if, if and when we do, it'll be, again, a team effort, you know, something that, that'll go through our deacons. And um, y'all know that, you know, I want to be careful, but I don't want to be too careful. Uh, and I don't want to be not careful enough. I want to be that, I want to be that standard of careful, right? <laughs> you know, that's the right one. Um, so, uh, so right now we're kind of waiting on them. I, I think right now, as we see tonight, as we saw this morning, we're in that mode where the folks that feel safe in coming, we're open. We have it going on. We're still streaming. So the folks that don't feel safe in coming, you know, we're kind of straddling that to help meet as many people's needs as we possibly can. So if it, if it becomes a situation, though, where we need to, we'll communicate it like we have. Hopefully we won't have to, but still got a little 2020 left. So <laughs> it's, uh, it is what it is. Children's it's children's two weeks from today, the 13th. Okay. And, and, and of course, that, that kind of hangs in the yeah, balance. Well, as soon as we know something, we'll have our deacons meeting the 6th, so yeah. a week from today. And, uh, you know, I'm sure in there that'll be one of our big topics of discussion. Uh, but pray for us in that. Pray with us in that. that and, and you guys watching at home, pray with us in that, that we do what we need to do and do it safely. That's what we try to do. We hadn't been perfect in it. Uh, we've set some things out that people hadn't been perfect in following, but that's okay. That's well, up to yeah. everybody else, you know. So. What we did for Thanksgiving, I had a lot of good uh, feedback on that. Sure. And who knows? That was a new thing that yeah. was that was necessary for a specific purpose, but it may bring to us mm -hmm. new ways of doing things, yeah. just like we were talking about from Scripture tonight. So, Well, let's wrap up and pray together this evening. Lord God, we love you and we thank you that you are doing new things. God, you're doing with the same message of the gospel, uh, new things and new hearts uh, that, that have not responded to you and that need to respond to you in new and different ways as well. So Lord God, would you continue to use us to share that but, Father, for us to be able to share that message, we've got to understand it ourselves. So help us to understand what you're doing in our hearts. Help us not to battle you when you're leading us in growth. But, Father, help us to follow you. So change our minds and change our hearts. Let us follow you with all that we are, Father, to celebrate what you're doing and not to have to fear it. Because we know that if you're doing it, it's good. So help us to see you and to follow you in all things. Go with us now. Be with those who are sick, who are in trouble, who are hurting. Father, help them in ways that only you can and help us to do the same in what we can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.